Have you ever been intrigued by mysterious, magical symbols in an old book? Legends of alchemists transforming nature using occult science? Or mystical hidden visions of a supernatural world? Then you may be interested in one of the newest and most dynamic fields in scholarship, Western esotericism. In this video, we're going to introduce the field, explore how scholars disagree about just what it is, and talk a little bit about where you can study it more in depth. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. So before we dive into the concepts, figures, and history of Western esotericism, we should say a little bit about what the field itself is. Broadly speaking, esotericism is the hidden inner dimension of religion, spirituality, and philosophy. And it covers a wide range of topics, including alchemy, magic, theosophy, mysticism, secret societies, and more. It's a very exciting field for a few reasons. Number one, it's a completely new academic field, and it really only came into existence in the 1990s, so there is a ton of exciting research to be done. Number two, it's an inherently interdisciplinary field, which involves scholars of history, religion, science, language, literature, and more. Number three, it covers topics that are honestly just fascinating and mysterious. So what is Western esotericism? Well, it's complicated and there's a lot of scholarly disagreement about it. I want to cover what I take to be three of the major approaches to the field itself. Before we get to those, I want to talk about what is sometimes called the insider approach, or the emic approach. This approach claims that there is, in fact, a hidden inner truth lying within philosophy, spirituality, and religion dating back millennia and transmitted to the present. Sometimes this approach claims to have access to what is called a perennial philosophy, or a prisca theologia, that is, a fundamental, often mystical truth which unites philosophy, spirituality, and even science. This approach is taken by people who see themselves as part of a Western esoteric tradition. Overall, this position is considered non-academic, and there's serious scholarly doubts about just how much we can talk about there being an actual coherent esoteric tradition. For instance, many figures in the field are much more different than they are alike in their religious or philosophical understanding. Of course, this doesn't mean that one can be part of a mystical tradition and also do scholarly research. Of course, many people who are religious also are scholars of religion. It just means switching hats, so to speak, from the inner commitments of one's faith to the neutral academic constraints of scholarship as needed. That said, let's turn to our first academic method for the study of Western esotericism. This position argues that all esoteric philosophies or spiritualities actually share a set of similar unifying concepts or motifs. For instance, the pioneering French scholar Antoine Faiva argues there are six of these concepts. These include, number one, correspondences, that there is a metaphysical link between all things in the cosmos. For instance, there's often a link made between the metal silver and the moon. Two, living nature. That is, that the cosmos is in fact alive rather than just being inert matter, as in many typical theories of physics. Number three, imagination and mediations. That the imagination is actually an organ which perceives hidden reality, and that hidden reality contains hidden levels beyond this physical realm. Number four, the experience of transmutation. That rather than being merely intellectual, Western esotericism aims for an inner transformation of the adherent through mystical or supernatural means. Number five, the practice of concordance, that the various strands of esoteric philosophy and religion are actually unified by a deeper, more fundamental truth. For instance, the linking of Kabbalah, tarot, astrology into one mystical system. And lastly, number six, transmission, that these truths can only be passed from generation to generation by specific modes. For instance, master-disciple relationships are being initiated into a secret society in which various grades of initiation reveal various secrets. The structural approach is great because it gives scholars clear parameters by which to delineate the field of Western esotericism. 
but this can also be perceived as a limitation. By drawing such a clear boundary, certain aspects of the field may be left out or underemphasized. A second approach is sometimes referred to as the religionist approach. This approach argues that in order to truly understand the figures, philosophies, and spiritualities of Western esotericism, we must study them on their own terms rather than contemporary, purely academic methods and categories. This position argues for a scholastic approach but allows the texts, figures, and philosophies under study to lead the way rather than give full priority to contemporary academic tools and methods. For instance, the American scholar Arthur Veslus has argued that Gnosis, a kind of super-rational understanding of fundamental reality, cannot be analyzed by a purely historical or empirical research program. This approach has the advantage of providing sympathetic readings of texts and ideas that have been much maligned as superstition or evil in past centuries. A third approach may be called the historical critical approach and understands Western esotericism as a result of historical, religious, and intellectual currents which are unified more by contemporary scholarship than by the figures being studied. This position argues that many of the figures and philosophies which comprise Western esotericism are the result of historical and cultural forces unknown to the very people creating them. Therefore, it's only possible to understand Western esotericism from the outside using the full scope of academic investigation. A more radical position holds that Western esotericism is entirely a construct of contemporary scholars and doesn't represent a historical or intellectual reality on its own terms. The division I've introduced is what makes the best sense to me, and I hope it's useful. Of course, scholars are still arguing about just what approach is best, and that's part of what makes the field so exciting. Here at Esoterica, I'm going to be a bit agnostic about these approaches, because I want to present figures, concepts, and ideas as sympathetically as I can, but at the same time, I want to remain within the best scholarship available. In a future video, I also want to take the time to explore each one of these approaches in detail. Stay tuned for that. As you can see, even the concept of Western esotericism is pretty contentious, and that debate is far from over, and that's part of what makes the field so exciting. Well, what if you want to get into the field of studying Western esotericism academically? Can you just go to your university and take an intro to Western esotericism class? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is that there are still very few places to study Western esotericism at the university level, and advanced degrees are only being offered in a handful of universities, including the University of Amsterdam, the University of Exeter, and Rice University. To my knowledge, only the University of Amsterdam is offering a PhD in Western esotericism. In a future video, I'll offer some tips and advice based on my experience studying in the program at Amsterdam. But there is good news. There are actually a ton of great scholarship being produced for the first time in history, and people with even a casual interest can dive deep into topics like magic and alchemy on their own. Manuscripts are being digitized, alchemical experiments are being recreated, and scholars are hanging out with and learning from witches. It's a great time to have an interest in Western esotericism. If you're interested in the field of esotericism generally, stay tuned. I'm going to talk about a couple of books which I think are really good. If you found this video interesting, I hope you'll click below to subscribe. Esoterica aims to specialize in topics like alchemy, magic, the occult, mysticism, and related subjects using the best scholarly resources. If you're interested in the future of the channel, also please check out my Patreon pitch. One of the difficult things about studying topics in Western esotericism is finding reliable scholarly information. And I want to recommend a few books that I think are excellent overviews to the entire topic itself. The first is Western Esotericism, A Concise History by the French scholar Anton Freifer. This is an excellent, very brief introduction to the field and covers what I called earlier the structural approach to Western Esotericism. It's a very concise text and I think that sometimes that's a weakness for it. It sometimes reads like a running bibliography and I think it could stand to be a couple hundred pages longer. The next text I think is really great is Magic and Mysticism, An Introduction to Western Esotericism by Arthur Versluis. This is an excellent example of what I would call the religionist approach. Versluis's text is excellent because it balances on the one hand a sympathetic reading of the text and figures with on the other hand a very scholarly understanding of the material. Highly recommended. The next text I'd recommend is Western Esotericism, A Brief History of Secret Knowledge by Koku von Stuckrad. 
Von Stuckrad is an excellent scholar, and I really appreciate his approach to religion in general. I studied with him when I was in Amsterdam, and this is an excellent introduction, especially if you're interested in Western esotericism through the lens of postmodernism or a kind of sociological or a Foucauldian analysis. So it's very good in that regard. However, I will say that this book is a bit difficult to find these days, but if you can find it, it's an excellent text. Next is The Western Esoteric Traditions, A Historical Introduction by Nicholas Goodrick Clark. Again, an excellent text from the historical critical perspective, although I will say that what's conspicuously missing from this text is an analysis of esotericism and politics, which is actually Goodrick Clark's expertise. It's missing. I think this book could be a bit better if it were there, but an excellent overview of Western esotericism from a historical perspective. And lastly, I'll mention what I take to be the best introduction to Western esotericism out in early 2020 is Western Esotericism, A Guide to the Perplexed by Walter Hanegraaff. This is an excellent overview of the field, both from a methodological point of view, from a historical point of view, and I will say that the bibliography and recommended reading list is worth the price of the book alone. It is an excellent resource for anyone starting off in the field of Western esotericism, and I highly recommend picking it up. I hope these resources are useful, and if you're interested in topics in Western esotericism, I hope you'll subscribe. We'll be covering a lot of material on this channel. I just want to say a couple special thanks to my brother Jonathan for encouraging me to start this channel, for helping me get some of the equipment that I needed to get it going, and also Tony Eggert from Three Lions, who really did a lot to help me get started with the camera and the lighting and other things that I had no idea about. I really hope to learn more and I hope to produce higher quality videos as I learn. I want to thank everyone who subscribed and especially my early Patreon supporters. This channel wouldn't exist without you. Thank you. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and this is Esoterica.